We've been very much enjoying an improvised piece performed by D. Byrne live at HG20 at the Moth Club on Sunday the 31st of July this year. And we are now in discussion with filmmaker John Clay joining me here on the microphone. Thank you so much, John, for coming in today. No worries. Thank you for having me. This is great. So what is the connection now, I know it, but the listeners don't, between D. Byrne's improvisation at the Moth Club and your film, Voodoo Nought. Sure, well, before we talk about Voodoo Nought, we'll talk about your film. I was there at the Moth Club to film on behalf of HD20, celebrating, what, 20 years of this radio station's um, significant, like, uh, 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 you know, ability to put forward your show. And seeing D live was just mind-blowing. Um, many people will listen to this music and hopefully they'll think of the, the cosmic out there, the loneliness of space. And um, I just had to ask Dee if I could use that improvisation to be part of Voodoo Nought, which is my sci-fi film. So that's the connection. <laughs> so is this a project that has had a lot of synchronicity along the way? Oh, it's been very modular. Like everybody that's been involved, whether it be actors or crew, have been people that I've either met on the music scene or in the film world. I've told them about what I was doing. They wanted to get involved. Um, one of the performers, uh, Sophia from Starsha Lee, um, they study Buto and their studying of that dance and their particular, um, say, idiosyncratic portraiture just had to be part of it. So they'd act, they've actually done some filming as well as be in the film itself. So, yeah. Because this is very much a collaborative effort. Yes, very much so. Um, there's another band. I'm going to be doing a lot of shout outs to bands now, even though I'm talking about my film. Another band called Aloha Dead, uh, a couple. They were in this film, courtesy of the fact that I filmed them in a live session for Margot's Living Room, which is a live session series that I used to do. And um, just the ideas that we had over lockdown about creativity and filming just spawned into this thing that became 15 minutes to half an hour, and it now currently stands at 112 minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's no surprise you're working with all these artists and a lot of the musicians, because you've been a stalwart of the South London live music scene for many, many years now. I mean, I don't suppose there's many people who rival you in terms of what you must have in the can, in, in terms of <laughs> <laughs> archive footage of the, of the live music scene. Well, I'll tell you now, one of the filmmakers, Lou Smith would definitely have I would say if I was him a certain amount of uh, uh, issue with what you've just said um, I'm merely a baron to his uh, kingdom <laughs> <laughs> So Lou Smith another person who's involved with the project Yes, um, he was fantastic and has been continually just a fantastic mentor, he filmed quite a few of the say dialogue scenes, um, I say dialogue there's a few subtitle elements in this film and featuring um, another musician Camille Alexander of a band called The Void plays a character called Connie and whenever she speaks she opens her mouth but we don't actually see her mouth moving it's just subtitles so a little bit of Brechtian um, expressionism going on there. So <laughs> give us give the listener a little bit of a, a synopsis of Voodoo Nought. Fair enough. Um, Lieutenant Julia Earle is a pilot on an experimental mission in space to negotiate with a UFO that's it's heading towards Earth. It's been doing so for the last few decades. And unfortunately, and this is the inciting incident, she loses uh, her communication with ground control. And so therefore, she's on her own in space and has to deal with her inner demons and outer space oddities and uh, the deconstructive element is not if she can save the world but if she feels that she ought to and if she wants to come back so there's some nihilism in there as well but hopefully uh, people find it interesting because I just want to say I think a lot of people find the idea of sci-fi normally attached to another genre that of the action adventure and um, I'm quite a lover of what has gone before say Tarkovsky or say Solaris and various other philosophically minded sci-fi expressions <laughs> <laughs> is it as much about an inner space than the outer space? Very much more so. I mean, um, anyone who, you know, was alive during the whole situation that we had in, like, say, 2020's pandemic when they didn't actually have the ability to go out, I think had a lot of opportunity to really delve into their inner self. Um, a lot of institutions were spoken about and uh, investigated for various, say, either racial or gender, um, uh, well, issues. I think this film really comments on a lot of my thoughts of that time. So, so, so Voodoo Nought like was it. born out of the lockdown era. 
it took a lot of life from there. It was born, um, I say, a little bit before that in 2019. Um, that's when I really started doing this idea of a film. And then um, during my work on it, I discovered that in a way our imaginations have been somewhat colonized. You know, the people that will create a lot of these sci-fi adventures, if not being funded by certain people, will have a certain kind of mindset as to be out there in space. Like, I've got a question for you and the listeners. How many sci-fi films can you think of have got um, a lead protagonist who is a woman of color? It's not my um, forte sci-fi genre, perhaps. I can't think of one. I can't think of any. Um, the only ones I could think of in my research, I thought of there was Zoe Saldana in Avatar, but she is not the lead performer. And there's also Zoe Saldana again in uh, Star Trek. And yes, Zoe Saldana appears again in Guardians of the Galaxy. And in two of those franchises, she's not actually, you know, a woman of color in terms of what we can relate to. She's either green or blue. So it made me think about emancipation in space faring films and why that's the case. And um, without giving too much away about Voodoo Nought, there's there's something to that. So, yeah, if you enjoyed, say, films like, say, Get Out and Alien, it's got stuff from both of those different franchises now if people want to sort of have an example of the the, the flavor visually that y you're exploring there are there is an example online and there's reason why we want to try to get people into the idea of this film is because you're actually doing a gofundme aren't you that's right 95 percent of the film's done though however tomorrow which is why i'll be rushing off after this i'll be filming in a south london location to film the rest of it so if people want to help fund that there still is time to help by um do i do i say it now yeah, do i do my do. salesman yeah, thing yeah, yeah, do. that's why yeah that's why <laughs> indeed yeah let's keep it real um if you type in voodoo naught into your search engine which is um voodoo and then naught n-a-u-t then you should find the gofundme and uh, if for whatever reason that doesn't come up put voodoo naught gofundme and you should find it <laughs> and basically tomorrow you've got what is this like the biggest this is the last biggest scene that you need to try and complete i would say yes yeah we've got um i don't want to give it away but we're doing a, a certain period piece that is relevant to all this sci-fi um uh, happening and hopefully with the money coming in we can make sure that everyone is paid exactly how much i think they ought to be so yes that's very much crucial in terms of the visual content, it's it's really beautiful images, but it strikes me that it must be a challenging thing to convey out of space when you're here on Earth. Yeah. How are you? How are you getting around that? Is it CGI or is it more creative filmmaking? Wonderful, and I'm lovely to be in the presence of someone who might actually discern the difference between CGI and creativity. Though there are friends of mine who will probably have issue with that. <laughs> um, I would say that we had to lean into the fact that the budget was very, quite minimal. And so, as I said, we were looking at sci-fi films from before. Um, there's a wonderful filmmaker called Maya Deren. Um, and if you're into, say, like stuff by Jim Jarmusch or David Lynch, then Maya Deren is definitely someone to look at because they were definitely the idea of, like, say, if you had someone walking on the beach, they could walk from that place into, say, a dining hall. So that kind of sensibility was what I was looking for in terms of how we were filming. Instantly, if you do check out um, a film called Meshes in the Afternoon on YouTube, it's their short film, which they famously said they made for the price of a lipstick. And seeing that makes you realize you don't actually need tons of CGI to make your ideas happen. Um, and Fincher pretty much said that as well but enough name dropping for me <laughs> <laughs> well i mean visually it, it it struck me as being sort of akin to the feel i get off of the man who fell to earth nicholas rogue or something like oh that. yeah for sure for sure i think there are many different ways you can actually show the perspective of someone going out into space with a little bit of an um you know invitation of Im imagination i think um but yeah it's been so much time since i've seen nicholas rogue's Man who fell to earth, so I'd feel uh, remiss to not feel happy that we'd talked about it to an extent, but I wouldn't be able to quote it in the best way. <laughs> so, John, if you're filming this scene tomorrow, in realistically, what what's the time frame on on something like this, on completing this, and then what happens when it's completed? I assume you look towards the film festival. Good question. Um, I was happy just to put it together and then at some point put it out there for free. But um, from what I'm hearing from various people who've seen aspects of it, I feel encouraged now to put it out there. Um, I would like to say that by March 2023, this thing will be something that I know will stop suckling on me, this creature that I've helped give life to, and we can actually put it out there. So I'd say sometime after March, I'd like to put it out, hopefully, um, in like, say, 
I don't know, the the autumn period. We wouldn't have to have so much, um, say, competition, as much as I hate that word, with the whole summer market, you know, with the bigger, bigger films. And I do guess. you have film festivals in mind? I mean, are there sort of go-to... Well, that's the thing. There's quite a few film festivals, which obviously, um, given the fact that I, I still see myself as quite an entry-level student, this whole thing, that will probably be more inclined to doing shorts. So I might be inclined to take in the section of the movie um, which seems to have its own kind of like uh, beginning, middle and end and enter that. But um, you never know. I think uh, maybe we'll be back on the show to talk about that once it's done. <laughs> and then, I mean, I, as I said, I originally knew you as, as a filmmaker filming music, but I know that you've also now written a novel and here you are with your feature film. What, what's next, John? Um, I'll tell you what, in line with the tradition of this particular interview, what's next is really me just like telling more people about this film being an inclusive element of people who have worked with for some time in a different capacity filming them play music. Barbara Pugolesi, um, I've never said her surname out loud before, so I hope I haven't butchered it, but they were amazing um, playing a, a character who is known as the Prime. And that character is basically a, a forgotten goddess that's been erased from history by early man due to a certain kind of patriarchal jealousy. So shout out to her because she's been so so good thank you 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 obviously wrote this script well yeah um i i, I want to say that i feel more like a, a curator than a director because every other thing that's in there was an idea that was suggested by either aloha dead um or say star Lee's uh, sophia like there were all these ideas about how we could deal with certain characters and how they would interrelate with each other and so I, d I don't feel right saying that I wrote the script and the fact is it's quite modular one idea gave birth to something else and before you know it we had a collection of ideas and we'd get rid of an earlier idea so that these new ideas could have pure form you know so I did break quite a few of my own rules hence it being three years of, of filmmaking hopefully ending soon <laughs> in breaking these rules it sounds though as if you're s forging new pathways things that you will now use as part of your artistic process yeah i'd say so um in many ways it is what you would think of as a glorified student film project but because i'm i'm working with people that i have so much respect for there's so much stuff that i've had to cut away knowing that even though I might be emotionally attached to making that, it's not helping the film or the story of the character. Um, so yeah, yeah, good, good question there. A bit like <laughs> when you're in a band, serve the song. Oh, so much so, so much so. It's, it's incredibly, um, uh, it's, it's so possible to fall out of ideas um, no, no, let me rephrase that. It's impossible, in fact, to like not love what you're doing, but sometimes you can get lost in the artifice of what you've created. You know, um, I was talking to a director friend, John Dower, um, who, if you Google him, he's done 30 years of The Bill and uh, Silent Witness and EastEnders, but he talked so much the other day when we were in the pub about how you have to really, truly hone the idea of the story and simplify it as much as you can. The complications will come later. John, I just want to quickly recap on the fact that we, we've asked people if they want to contribute in any small way to this film, they can do so. There's a GoFundMe uh, page, uh, Voodoo Nought, V-O-O-D-O-O, -O -O -O, Voodoo, N-A-U-T. And are there any sort of incentives in terms of like, if you pay 10 quid, you'll get the T-shirt? Or God, you're so good at this. Um, there are incentives. And by all means, we will make sure that they're, they're sorted out. If you pay £10, then you get to have a free like seat at our screening. So you can come and check. Uh, it will be the test screening. So you get a chance to not only watch the film, but you can critique it. You can really go to town on it. If you pay £20, which is great, quite a lot of people have done more than that, um, you actually to get your name up in lights so to speak we'll put your name in the credits um, and if you pay 50 pounds you get access to a documentary about the actual film um, and you can't get this documentary any other way my promise is that when I turn 90 or 100 I still won't release it there might only be three or four people who get to see the bloody thing <laughs> <laughs> well look John thank you so so much for coming in and let and uh, talking about Voodoo Nought and I'm sure people are intrigued they would like to find out more go online you're you're on online as well on YouTube yeah, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Facebook, all the social media Under platforms. Under John Clay? Yeah, type John Clay. Um, you should find me quite easily. This has been so good. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. And you're not away for too long, are you? Because in fact, 
um, in a real sort of uh, yeah, nepotistic way, perhaps it could be said. We've got you returning uh, on the 17th of December with your band Colossus. Yes, the beauty of nepotism means that I'll be back here on the 17th of December. So by all means, if you like rock and roll, then I should be doing that. But that's a story for another time. Uh, yeah, we will talk about Colossus on the 17th of December. Put it in your diary. John Clay, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, right. Later on in the show, we will have live music from Astrakhan.